welcome to Series 4, Episode 5 of In Suspense, a podcast and vodcast for fans and writers of crime fiction. I'm Leslie Cara and my co-host is Lauren North. Hello! You may have noticed that we had a short mid-series break, but we're back now and raring to go. Um, in the last show before our break, we talked to uh, Louise Mangos and Emma Christie um, about their books and about working with an independent publisher. And that was really great fun. So if you haven't caught that one yet, do tune in. I, I highly recommend it, if for nothing else than for, for hearing Laurie tell Emma Christie off, because that was really funny. <laughs> Yeah, it's just one of those things though, isn't it? Like, because I know I do it as well. If I'm a guest on a show, I also then, I can't help but kind of like want to be the ones asking the questions. I think you just get in the mindset of it. That's right. Yeah. She took it well and obviously it was just a joke. She'd hasten to add. Of course it was a joke, Emma. <laughs> but this week we will be talking to Trevor Wood and the topic is submissions and the long road to success. And I really hope that Trevor behaves himself, Laurie, or you might have to tell him off too. I'll tell him off as well, yeah. <laughs> but first let's get on to the equally important topic of us and our long list of ailments, which obviously will be fascinating to all our listeners. <laughs> But you know, you've been you've been under the weather, Laurie, haven't you? Because you've had the dreaded COVID. I've had COVID, yeah. My daughter got it and was asymptomatic, had no symptoms, and I got it about four days after her. She baked this delicious chocolate cake, which I put on Twitter. We we called it the COVID cake. Um, she was like licking it, she was doing it. Um, but it was inevitable. We didn't do any kind of isolation. So um three out of the four of us got it. Um, yes, I was quite poorly. I think I'm sure I had a mild version, but it, yeah, it really did hit me so I spent about a week just lying down on the sofa doing nothing but sleeping and listening to audiobooks so uh yeah that that's uh, sort of wiped out our whole half term really unfortunately and um yeah I was sorry to miss the Bay Tales virtual show on Tuesday the 26th of October which I'm sure was a great um, prelude to their inaugural live show which is happening on the 12th of February in 2022 um, in Whitley Bay Playhouse, which uh, I'm very much looking forward to going to. Yes, me too. Can't wait. Can't wait for that. It was, we really missed you, Laurie. But... Oh, thank you. Yes, I was just too under the weather that day. Um, so what, also you've been quite busy too, haven't you, Leslie, with trips to A&E and literary festivals? Trips to A&E and literary festivals. That's my life. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've had problems with my eyes. I mean, as you know, I already suffer from glaucoma, but that's kind of under control. I've had various treatments and things for that. But um, yeah, I, I woke up one day and I had this influx of these, you know, horrible floaters more than I normally have. Those little sort of blob tadpole like mm. things that float around in your eyes. You probably haven't got any yet, Lauren, because you're <laughs> far too young. But they do come with age, and particularly if you're short-sighted, apparently. And um, But not only that, I had um, a flashing lights as well in my eyes. And I was really worried that it was retinal detachment, because my optician has always said, you know, be really careful if anything like that happens, go straight to A&E. So I did go straight to A&E, but it wasn't, thank God, retinal detachment. It was something called vitriol detachment, which is where the... Sorry, but, sorry about it. It's a crime show, really. But anyway... <laughs> Uh, it's where the vitreous humour comes away from the eye, apparently, and it causes the, the eye that floaters and flashes. So. It sounds really serious. What was it? Did you have to have some treatment? Didn't have any treatment. So I was in A&E for three hours. It was really ridiculous because I got there and you know how you have to wait, you have to go through triage and everything. And they, they asked all these questions and took my blood pressure. And I'm thinking, you need to look in my eyes. Don't take yeah. my blood pressure. Um, and then eventually I saw another nurse and he said, um, oh, we might have to get you seen by the eye clinic. And I'm thinking, you don't say. <laughs> but anyway, they were very good. Uh, mustn't complain. The NHS is brilliant. I'm not complaining. Yeah. I mean, where would, where would we be without it? But it was a little bit frustrating because I was so scared. You know, I think that's the thing. When you're scared, you're very, you know, you want, you, you really. Of course, anxious. of course. But it was fine. They said it's not a medical emergency and just to keep keep an eye on it. <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, <laughs> that was it. So I've now just got to put up with this horrible flibbity flobbity tadpole -y thing floating in front of my eyes, which is very oh. annoying. Have you been able to do any writing? Is oh, I have. Yes. I mean, I'm apparently my brain will learn to ignore this thing. I just hope oh. it, it hurries up and ignores it. And if it doesn't, I've just got to live with it. But yeah. 
there you go. But anyway, on to more interesting topics than my eyeballs. Um, the yeah, Lit Frinton Literary Festival was in October the uh, last week, and uh, and that was great fun. I went. I mean, I've moved away from Frinton now, but I I went back and. Um, I was interviewing um, S.J. Watson, who's been on the show, hasn't he? And Fiona yes, Barton, who hasn't. And we must get Fiona on. Yes, um, we should. We should, yeah. And that was really good fun. And so um, I interviewed them on the Thursday night for the Crime and Wine event. And they're such good um, speakers and they've got so many interesting little stories and anecdotes to tell. And the audience really loved them. So that's oh, amazing. I'm sure it sounds amazing. It was really good. So, yeah. So, um, oh, and what else should we talk about? Something else is happening in this month, isn't it? Because as we record this show, it is the 1st of November. Yes. Which is NaNoWriMo, isn't it? So um, I am doing that this year for the first time ever, um, which I think would surprise anybody who knows my love of a word count that I've never done it before. But over all the years I've been writing, I've always been doing structural edits in November for some random reason. I don't know why it's always fallen that way, but I seem to be ahead of the game this year as my structural edits have just finished. My book's now going off to copy edit. Hooray. Yay. So I am writing 50,000 words this month is my aim to get my second romance finished. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I think just because it's been a, a tough couple of weeks for me, I'm a bit nervous about it, I think. But I've done my words today. So day one's done. I noticed that because obviously we're now buddies on NaNoWriMo and I noticed that you've already done over your word count for today so you're very good indeed not not that I'm spying on you I just happened to notice that you'd already done 2,000 words by something like eight o'clock I thought well I know I got I did six six o'clock I got up early to get started but I just had this one scene that had been going around my head that I got down but I think it's going to be harder and harder the more that goes yeah. on the harder it is I think so I'm going to try and spend time in the afternoons making sure I know exactly what I'm writing the next day so it should hopefully flow. I think that's the key isn't it I mean I have tried it before and didn't complete it because as you know I'm I haven't traditionally been interested in historically traditionally whatever I haven't usually been interested in word count it hasn't been the thing that motivates me but I've kind of got back into doing you know at least 500 words a day and I got a little bit behind on my schedule what with everything going on with my eyes and visitors and all sorts of things and so I thought well maybe I will give it a real proper go this month and try and get my first draft if not finished then the bulk of it done because I, yeah. I think like you I've done about 20,000 words of book five so far um and I've done about 862 words this morning and it was a it's a chore for not a chore but it's a it's a it's difficult for mm. me not to keep going back and reading what I've just written and I uh, yes not, you're not meant to do that um mm. in NaNoWriMo and so I've had to sort of change the way I do it so I've I was writing a couple of paragraphs and I thought I really wanted to go back and read them and check they were okay and edit them and I forced myself not to do that <laughs> And as it was, managed to do 862 in half an hour. So that's incredible. That's amazing, yeah. So then I'll do another half hour stint, probably this afternoon or this evening, and hopefully get the get the word count done today. Yes. So see, cross fingers. <laughs> yes, great. So do come and find us if you are listening to this and also doing NaNoWriMo. We are on there um, and come and buddy with us. And um, yes, yeah. I'm, I'm on there as Lelly Belly. I don't know why, but there you go. That's that's what I'm writing under. And I think okay, you're... okay. I'm, I'm. I think I'm Laurie Wrights twenty one because it's the year twenty twenty one, not because I have any aspirations of being twenty one. Yes, I don't know why I called myself Lelly Belly. I think when I first joined, which was last year, I didn't want to be make it sort of. I didn't want to be, uh, you know, make it no obvious that it, who I you, was. You, you, yeah, I got that. Incognito. Yeah, incognito. But of course, this year I think, what's the point of being incognito? I won't be able to. Um, buddy up with any of my pals if I if I don't do that so I, yes but I can't change my username I don't think oh really oh that's interesting I was going to change mine to 2022 next time around but... if you find a way of changing your username then let me know oh, I will I will let you know anyway <laughs> But our, our topic for today, as um, Leslie said, is submissions and the long road to success. Um, and we have actually spoken about our long roads to success quite a bit over the last four series. Um, so I think we probably will just jump straight into having a chat with the lovely Trevor Wood, shall we? Yay, Trevor! Yay! Hello, Trevor Wood, and welcome to In Suspense. We've been longing to have you on the show, and so we're delighted that you're finally here. 
Oh, it's absolutely lovely to be here. No better way to start my week. Oh, you old charmer, you. <laughs> now, I'm going to read your bio, first of all, Trevor. Okay. Trevor Wood has lived in Newcastle for 30 years and considers himself an adopted Geordie. He's a successful playwright who has also worked as a journalist and spin doctor for the City Council. Prior to that, he served in the Royal Navy for 16 years. Trevor holds an MA in creative writing, crime fiction, from UEA. The Man on the Street, his first novel, was published to widespread critical acclaim and won the 2020 CWA New Blood Dagger. It was also long listed for the prestigious Theakston's Old Peculiar Crime Novel of the Year Award. One Way Street is his second novel, out in paperback next week, and his third, Dead End Street, is out in January in hardback, ebook and audio. Now Trevor, I'm no detective, but I am detecting a slight pattern in the titles here. <laughs> <laughs> With the word street in them. <laughs> Well, funnily enough, it wasn't. Um, I mean, they, the man on the street was my suggestion, ultimately, but the working title of the book for a long time um, was When a Fire Starts to Burn. Oh, uh, oh I like that. I really liked and still do like, but but it, it's also the name of a song that I quite like. Um, and fire is a big kind of um, uh, motto that goes, a uh, motif rather, that goes through the first book. Um, However, my publishers, you know, as they will, decided it was a bit too long, a bit too obscure, um, and they wanted something a bit punchier. So The Man on the Street was my second suggestion. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a great title. Yeah, really, I really liked it, yeah. and I've grown to love it. But of course, after that, they wanted just street titles. So unusually, all three are my suggestions. It's, it's pretty unusual for writers to get their title. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm three for three, really, if you discount the first one being thrown out. That, that kind of leads to an inexhaustible supply of titles, because there are all sorts of things that could be... Uh, Somebody I was like, the word street. I said, I'm going to run out of titles soon. And they said, there's a lot of streets out there. And I thought, <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> now, Trevor, can you tell us a little about this trilogy of books for those people who, who aren't aware or who haven't read them? Can you tell us what they're about? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, the whole street trilogy is very firmly set in Newcastle's homeless community. Uh, the protagonist, Jimmy Mullen, is a, an ex-serviceman, but has been long-term homeless. Um, uh, not so much when we meet him, but um, the books are set uh, back and have moved on a few years. So, it's, so he's been homeless for quite a while. Uh, and in the first book, he sees a murder, but because he's homeless and he's also got PTSD, nobody really pays any attention to his claims. Uh, and he sees an appeal from a young girl whose father's missing and it looks like the guy he saw being attacked in Newcastle. Um, so he contacts her just to let her, let her know what he saw and, and gets dragged into helping her find out what's happened to her father. Uh, I, was, I, I wrote it initially as a standalone, absolutely as a standalone, had no thoughts of it being a series whatsoever because it's about a homeless man who sees a murder. I, I, I wanted it to be real. I like to think it's it's based in reality, the situation, if you like. Um, and I didn't want him tripping over the bodies like he was in Midsummer Murders for the next 10 years. Made no, no sense at all to me. Um, but everybody was interested in it, said it was a series. And I tried to um, argue the other way, but ultimately they were saying, well, we want a series. Uh, so I, I eventually persuaded myself that it could run to a trilogy. Um, so I had to find other ways of telling the story about Jimmy. Uh, but he's got a couple of friends slash sidekicks. So they come into the stories a bit more in the second and third books. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, I really enjoyed The Man on the Street and I'm really looking forward to reading the second and third in the series. I mean, it's such a great premise, isn't it? Having such a great and original premise, having a homeless man as the, as the sleuth. It's, it's fantastic. I like the idea that I liked a couple of things about it when I first thought about it. Well, when I say I first thought about it, it was my wife's idea originally. So credit where it's due. Um, but I like the idea of playing with the invisibility of the homeless that nobody really notices they're there. So as a kind of witness to a crime, it's entirely believable because they could be sitting in the doorway saying something and nobody even has a clue that they're sitting there. So I kind of like playing with that. But I also liked 
exploring how people end up on the streets as part of the crime novel. So in the first book, we not only follow the current story, but we get little flashbacks to how Jimmy has ended up where he is. And then in the second and third books, we find out how his two friends have ended up living on the streets. So I quite like telling those stories as well. Uh, and I completely agree with Leslie, a fantastic premise. Um, so can you tell us um, a little bit about what inspired you to write Jimmy Mullen? Um, because when I read it, um, I just thought you really nailed the um, sort of life on the streets as well. It wasn't like a cliched at all. It just felt so natural and so realistic. So can you talk about like the research you did as well and sort of how Jimmy came about? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, that was a given for me when I first thought about it. I wasn't sure I was the guy to write it, to be honest. I haven't been homeless myself. Um, but when I started to do the research, and the figures vary quite a bit, but roughly they think somewhere between about 7 and 10% of the homeless are ex-servicemen. Um, and as you mentioned in the bio, I was in the Navy for 16 years. So, so I know about being an ex-serviceman. So that was a kind of starting point for me. So then I started to research about, about how ex-servicemen end up on the streets, because that was fascinating for me. It was the idea that somebody who used to be so competent and organised and disciplined would end up living on the streets was, was fairly surreal. But, but in most cases, it comes down to PTSD, it's some kind of damage that, that they've suffered in their service, if you like. So I started to look into that. Um, there's a brilliant book called um, The Veteran's Survival Guide by a guy called Jimmy Johnston which was a huge resource for me. Um, he's an ex-army guy who served in Northern Ireland for a couple of terms uh, and got PTSD so badly that one morning he woke up with a dead body next to him and he's in prison for life for murder now. Um, there's no recollection about what he did. Uh, oh, wow. But he's written a book basically urging servicemen to get treatment for their problems because the nature of the beast is that they don't want to ask for help at all because they've been talked to solve their own problems and you know um uh, so they're the last people on earth who go and get help so th th that book was a big resource and i started um i went down to see the people's kitchen in newcastle which is an amazing charity that feeds uh, then it fed about 100 people every single day of the week uh, entirely volunteers um the whole organization nobody gets paid so i went down there to see what they did in their work and to meet some of the people who used it uh, and ended up eventually volunteering there. I couldn't get in at first. There's, there was a waiting list uh, to even work there. Uh, yeah. But for about the last four years, I've been working in the kitchen, cooking on a Tuesday afternoon for what's now about 200 people every day. Um, wow. It's been incredibly useful as well. And it's very rewarding. And it gets me off my fat ass. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that sounds a really, you know, good amount of research. And, and, and as you said, a really worthwhile thing to do. Um, that can sort of you know further inspire you i guess um for, for well, future it only work if it felt real i didn't want to sugarcoat it i didn't want to make it seem you know like there's some kind of gentleman detective who mm. just happened to be living on the street so mm. i wanted to ground it in reality um and you've got to know what you're talking about i think if you yeah do that. Absolutely. It's got real authenticity. I, I, I really, really loved it. Um, I was, I mean, I'm always mulling over ideas. I'd, I'd love to be able to write a series. I really would. You know, it's it's quite hard in the psychological thriller genre in which um, I yeah, write and, and Laurie writes to, to sort of come up because I, I don't write detective fiction. But yes, as, as an amateur sleuth, having a homeless person is great. But um, you said a little while ago that you you never intended it as a trilogy you were starting to write a standalone so would you like uh, and are you intending to go on and write a standalone you know your, for book four or will you be tempted to do more of jimmy or write another series what what, what are your plans oh, i when my publishers were insisting it was a series I, as i said i kind of kicked back about it a little bit but obviously ultimately you kind of, <laughs> you don't have a great deal of choice really. If they're saying they want a series, you give them a series. Um, but I did kind of stamp my feet a bit and said, look, I, I can see my way to a trilogy, but, I, but I'm doing no more than that. It will, it will lose its authenticity if I keep having stumbling over murders. So to my surprise, they've, they've stuck with that. I thought I might get a little bit of pressure after the third one. Um, but Jane Woodett Quirkus, my editor has been true to her word. 
so yeah the, i'm working on a standalone at the moment um wow. about three quarters of the way through it in fact so it's it's coming on but is it I, nice being able to write something different as well now after three books in some ways laurie yeah mm. I, mean, I mean i it's given me a lot more sympathy for for my friends and, and people like yourselves who are writing standalones every time pretty much is because mm. starting afresh with a new bunch of characters is pretty tough. I mean, writing a series has its own difficulties, uh, I think, um, not least how much of the previous books that you filter through the, the next book. So in the second book, how much do you have to retell of what happened? Mm. That, that caused me a few hiccups along the way, I think. But starting afresh every single time is a tough gig, I think. Uh, so I, I, I have found it <laughs> interesting and harder, certainly. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's a certain bit of you that finds it refreshing to, to just start again and, and create some new people. Yeah, I bet. Um, I always get asked if um, if one of my books will become uh, like a sequel. Um, and I was like, no, my characters are never left in a good enough place to be able to do anything with them. They're always quivering in the corner after what I've put them through. So there's no, uh, there's no space for a second book, the poor things, to leave them be. Um, um, you know, Harriet Tice was on my MA and she's my, probably my biggest crime writing friend. And I've always thought it was amazing that there was no sequel to Blood Orange because she's got a lawyer character, but... But I think talking to Harriet, it's because of what that character goes through in the first book that it's kind of yeah. to bring around. You don't want to start with a quivering mess for the second <laughs> one. Um, so now, Trevor, our topic for today is submissions and the long road to success. And I think it's fair to say that although you've been writing for a long while, both as a playwright and a journalist, you came to novel writing a little later in life. So we wondered... Oh, glory, is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> a little, a little. We wondered if writing has always, uh, writing a novel has always been a secret ambition of yours. I think probably the short answer to that is probably yes. I, I, I mean, I've always loved reading. Um, and when I was a kid, English was pretty much the only thing I was good at. I'm, I'm, I've got a, I'm very good at very simple mathematics. I can do immediately quick sums. Um, but anything more complicated than that, I'm useless. So English was the only thing I was any good at. So I always dabbled a little bit here and there with some writing, but never anything serious whatsoever. Um, uh, but when I left the Navy, I needed to find something else to do. And I, I kind of fancied being a journalist when I was a kid, but I didn't get the qualifications really. But by that stage of my life, I had got them. Um, and I managed to get a place on a journalism course. So that's where the kind of um, taking it a bit more seriously started. Um, and a guy who was on my journalism course, a guy called Ed Woff, who is, unlike me, an absolute native Geordie. He's about the Geordiest man I've ever met in my life. Um, he, he was trying to do something a bit more creative and for some reason decided that he wanted to enlist me to help him do it. And that's where the playwriting started. He persuaded me to give up my job as a, as a um, head of communications at Newcastle City Council at the time and take a year out to try and write and we wrote a play and um, ended up writing about 12 or 13 over the next 10 years uh, which did pretty well so wow you yeah, really. must be a quite persuasive person then <laughs> yeah, he is he is that um uh, not not just with me but with theatre managers and, and other people um we, we sat down in the January of 2002 to write, try and write a play having never written together before or indeed written a play or possibly even seen a play. I think we maybe seen about four between us. Uh, and our first play was on five months later at a professional theatre. That's which, so impressive. Which was insane, really. Um, uh, and we just went from strength to strength from there, really. Uh, that's brilliant. So it I was fantastic. That's, I yeah, guess that's why your dialogue's so good in your novels, because you've got that playwriting. That yeah, that's... It, that was the easy... That's the easy bit for me, I think. It, when, I, when I eventually decided to try and write a novel I, I i have as as most writers do i have my first novel in my drawer that's never really seen the light of day um mm -hmm. which i wrote as first person because it's dialogue really first person isn't it and uh, i thought that was my easy way into it and it was it was it's not a bad first novel it's kicking around somewhere it did get me an agent at the time um but it didn't get any further than that well, I was just going to ask you about that. I was going to ask you about how you got your agent, if you could tell us your sort of, you know, your road to publication, yeah. really, how you got your publishing deal. Okay. Well, like I say, I wrote, I wrote, when I sat down to write a novel, I, 
I, I took the easy route, really. I, I knew I could write dialogue having written a dozen plays or so. So I wrote a first person um, crime thriller. And actually the main character was an out of work actor. So I was, I was staying in safe ground, if you like. Um, uh, and eventually uh, it got me an agent. I mean, I was sending it around for quite some time. It got me an agent, but he was a terrible agent. Uh, I won't name him, but if anybody wants to message me privately, I can warn them off. <laughs> uh, I tried uh, several times to come down to London to meet him, but every time, despite giving him months and months of notice and like I'm down for five days, I never met him face to face. Um, after about nine months out on submission, he offered to uh, publish it under the agency's imprint, which I thought was a complete conflict of interest. Um, uh, I messaged him back almost immediately saying, thanks very much, here's your three months notice, um, mm -hmm. time to part ways, and a long explanation as to why, and got a one word reply that just said understood. And I thought oh. that was such a good decision. Um, I mean, you know how hard it is to get rid of an agent when you've got one, because it's tough to get one in the first place. Mm. Um, but I was already doing the MA then, and I, and I knew I didn't want to keep him because I was developing the man on the street on that course. And I didn't want to show it to him, and that's not a good sign with your agent. I, I thought it was too good to give to him. Um, so I went back in, into the, into the uh, world of unagented writers again. Um, and when I finished the MA, uh, it was quite fortunate, really. The, it was, I was on the very first crime writing MA at UEA, which was a, a kind of attempt for them to see if they could run those courses. And it was a brilliant course, absolutely fantastic. Uh, visiting writers, Lee Child, Ian Rankin, Mark Billingham, all came to talk to us in the classroom. Uh, and at the end of the course, they published an anthology, which is like the first 10,000 words of each writer's book that they've developed on the course. And then they have a, a, a kind of uh, a launch night and a reading night in London, um, which was the perfect opportunity to invite agents to come along. Um, so rather than sending out um, like a normal kind of uh, uh, inquiry letter to agents saying, here's my book, I, you know, I think you'd like it, you like this book and, you know, it's similar to that. We were able to just invite them to come and listen to us read from our, our new book. Um, and I, I had tried that approach, but I was getting no responses. And luckily, we had a really collegiate kind of gang on that course. So a couple of the other writers, Mel Nygate, who wrote a great book called A Righteous Spy, and Suzanne Mustaseach, who's an American uh, writer, kind of got my letter and, and tore it apart and said, no, this is what you've got to do. So I literally copied what they did. Um, and within a few, you know, within no time at all, had several agents going, oh, that's, that's really interesting, but I can't make it, but I, I wouldn't mind reading your book. Um, and one of those was Ollie Munson. Um, and I've kept his email. I, it's on my notice board, Pride of Place at the top, because um, he replied to me at about 1641 on the 3rd of October saying, I can't make it, but the book sounds interesting. Will you send it to me? Uh, and at nine o'clock the next morning, I got an email saying, I started reading this on the way home really enjoying it i'll keep you posted and i'm like oh my god <laughs> and then it, it, where's the time 1556 so that's less than 24 hours after i sent it to him uh, i got well it's not often a manuscript gate crashes my pile and i finish it within 24 hours uh, it's not perfect but it is very good can we have a chat tomorrow morning and i signed with him the following week um, amazing i've got goosebumps hearing yeah, that it's amazing a great story it's kind of the thing that you dream about, you know, and it was, and then having gone ages with nobody even responding to my messages at all, uh, that was incredible. But because of my previous experience, when he rang me up, I think we could have done the deal on the phone and tied it all up. But I was like, look, I had an agent before and I never even got to meet him and it, it would be good to meet you. And he said, that's all right, but I'm going to Hamburg on Tuesday, uh, Frankfurt, sorry, on Tuesday because it was the Frankfurt. Oh, October, yeah. And I said, well, what are you doing on Monday? And he said, well, no, I kept that free so I could catch up. So I said, well, I'll see you on Monday. And I got the train down from Newcastle and, and we had a quick chat and, and did the deal. Brilliant. Uh, and, and he's been fantastic ever since. Um, if anybody's looking for a very great agent, Ollie Munson, A.M. Heath. <laughs> I hope he'll be listening. He'll definitely be listening, won't he? <laughs> 
Well, that, oh, sorry, you're going, Leslie. Well, I was just going to say I was going to read out a quote, and that that what you've just said really illustrates this quote that I read. I read that you'd um, given somewhere that your journey to publication was a story of long gaps with sudden bursts of joy. So yeah. I can actually see why you said that now. That's, that's yeah. So that was you know that was a, one of the sudden bursts of joy. But then, then I had a, a incredibly long wait to get um, a publisher. So what, what happened then? Talk, talk us through what happened after you signed with um, with your agent then. Well, Ollie had a few notes, but but nothing massive really. So it didn't take very long um, for it to go on submission. So it probably went out on submission. I, 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 I can't find the full details, but I think probably at the end of October 2017, early November. Um, and quick as a flash, absolutely nothing happened. Uh, I think he submitted to about somewhere between 25 and 30 editors, I think, um, and just nothing, like radio silence completely. Um, and then kind of just after Christmas, I think January of the following year, um, he got a couple of expressions of interest, but nothing very firm, uh, but enough for me to go down and meet a couple of editors. One of them was as mad as a snake. Um, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> I mean, the two things I remember most was suggesting that Dog had a girlfriend. <laughs> I, I don't know what you do with that. I, for those who haven't read my books, Jimmy Mullen has a dog called Dog because when he when he when they discovered each other, he, he was so disengaged he couldn't even be asked to think of a name for his dog. Um, so yeah, they oh. suggested that Dog had a girlfriend, and they suggested that it, it would work better if there was some humour in the book and, and the place to put that would be when the three friends are together. Um, and for anybody who's read the book, I think that's where the humour is in the book. Um, so I was, you know, bemused and, uh, yeah. So so out of the two meetings, that was a shocker. Um, the first one was, that the other one was great. Um, it was with one of the Penguin imprints um, and... The editor was really positive and very encouraging, had had some reservations about some bits of the book, uh, but they had failed to get it through acquisitions. Um, I didn't know anything about acquisitions then. So, I, I mean, in brief, editors have to persuade the sales, the marketing people and everybody else in their, in their publishing group um, to, to go along with their decision. Uh, and he hadn't been able to do that, but he thought if I made the changes to the book, that he wanted that he would be able to go back to them and persuade them. Um, he gave me some very substantial notes, which took about three months um, to work on. But given that we haven't had any other offers, Ollie suggested that it would be a good idea um, to make the changes. And actually, once I got into it, I realized that they were very good suggestions. Um, so about three months later, I represented the book um, to the editor and he couldn't get it through acquisitions again. Um, so we were back to square one. Um, I've had friends who at that stage, their agent has said, you better go away and write another book because, you know, we've run out of options. Thankfully, Ollie, like me, still had faith in it. And so he went back out to about six editors with the book, with the new version. Uh, and we got three offers within about a week. Um, Amazing. Again, you know, another sudden burst of joy where nothing had happened. Um, and one of those was Jane Wood at Quirkus, who um, about two months later, we, we signed the deal with them. Um, that so just shows you the importance of having a good agent who believes in you, doesn't yeah, it? Absolutely, because like I say, uh, one of my friends on, on the MA, um, his book went out on submission for a long time, didn't get picked up, and he's basically trying to write his, a new book still to this day. Um, so it's tough when that happens, I think. Um, but yeah, Ollie was fantastic. I mean, I preempted it and sent him, sent him a list of publishers. I'd say, why don't we try these people? And he <laughs> said, um, yeah, I'll look at that later. I've got my own list. Thanks very much. <laughs> I suspect he was a better judge. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and also, I, I mean, I couldn't be in a happier place. Uh, Jane's a fantastic editor. Mm. I mean, she's she, when the first time I met her was actually at Harrogate because I was in, my daughter's in Canada. Um, doing an MA, now a PhD. So I was actually out in Canada when, when we spoke. So the first time I met her was when I came back at the Harrogate Crime Festival. 
uh, and we had lunch and she said that she'd edited Michael Connolly and James Lee Burke. And I was like, I think wow. I'm in the, it's like candid camera. I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> uh, so she's, she's been amazing mm -hmm. as well. Really great. Well, to go from such um, a long road to publication to such success, obviously must felt and must still feel amazing. Um, what advice do you give to anyone about to embark on the submissions process? You know, how, what would you say to them? God, be patient, persevere. Perseverance is about the best quality you can have as a writer, I think, because um, hardly anybody has an easy journey. I, I, almost everybody has a book in their drawer that didn't get anywhere that they tried to, to put out there. Most people have very, very long stories about how they couldn't get agents, how they got terrible agents or they couldn't sell their book. Um, or they, or even they just their first deal wasn't great and it got published, but nobody paid any attention to it. And, you know, it didn't get pushed. If you want to be a writer, you just got to keep going. Just keep going. You know, that's anything else. Don't give up. I, I can't say more than that. Persevere. Very true. Yeah, have faith. Just have faith in your own ability. If you if you if you think your book is good enough, but make sure it's good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and don't get it out there until it's as good as you can make it I think probably that's the second thing that's make sure it's brilliant don't you know get advice get, I've got a load of people who read my stuff now um, a little local writers group we meet up every every three weeks or so and chuck in a couple of thousand words um, I still share my work with Harriet Tice and Kate Simmons from my MA because um, that's what we did on the MA and it worked there so we've just kept doing that really for the next two or three books. Um, get other opinions, and but then get your book out there and have faith in it, I think. That's really good advice. Thanks. And don't get published during a lockdown. That's my no. problem. Mind you, it didn't do you too much harm. In the end. <laughs> it, it worked out eventually, Leslie, but at the time, you know. I mean, that's another part of the process, isn't it? I mean, I signed that deal in October 2018. Um, 18 month lead into publication I mean at the time it just seemed like it was a long way off but March 2020 didn't seem so significant but no. when it came out it was pretty significant yeah. yeah that must have been like a punch to the gut but uh, you well, know it, it, as I say it, it worked out pretty okay <laughs> in the end my, my um, book launch was cancelled on the day of the launch uh, oh on the lunchtime it was right it was before lockdown but it was just as everybody was getting a bit nervous mm. uh, and waterstone mm. sent out an edict to all their branches saying no more events at the lunchtime and my launch was that evening so, oh yeah how disappointing that how was, disappointing that was tough, tough <clears throat> thing, really. Now, Trevor, we always ask our guests what they've been reading lately <clears throat> oh dear here I go <coughs> sorry and whether they have any recommendations. So what's been on your TBR pile in the last few weeks? I, I read endlessly. I literally put a book down, pick another one up instantly. So I've always got a book on the go. Um, I'm currently reading uh, Mari Hanna's Without a Trace, The, the Return of Kate Daniels. Um, Mari is, is on Ollie's team as well, and also, also obviously a Northeast writer. Um, so she's been a huge um, help and support to me. Um, and I've had that book on my pile for bloody months and I, I'm doing a panel with Mari in December and I thought I really need to catch up. Um, so I'm, I'm reading very much enjoying that. Uh, what have I read recently that I've enjoyed? Um, I also read a, a, a new Quirkus writer, uh, Amen Alonge, who was on the um, uh, Noir at the Barbados thing the other night, uh, A Good Day to Die. That's a, that's a terrific book. Uh, not out yet, but look out for it because it's, it's pretty brutal. I don't. It's got a body count in the hundreds. I would imagine. Wow. <laughs> uh, and as you may have heard, it's quite sweary. Um, if you listened <laughs> that the other night. Yes. Uh, what else have I enjoyed? In the in the last six months, I really really liked Joe Knox's book, um, True Crime Story. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, if anybody's read Daisy Jones and the Six, it's like a crime version of that. Really told from umpteen different voices. I loved that. I mean, I, I really liked his other books as well, but um, this is a bit of a departure for him. And I also, bizarrely, I liked, so I liked True Crime Story, but I also really liked True Story. Um, oh, yes. I thought it was fantastic. 
um, very different. Um, but yeah, a bit bizarre. Two of my favourite books were called True Crime Story and True Story. So. <laughs> Yeah, I read True Story at Christmas. I really enjoyed it. It's a very clever book. Mm. Really, really interesting take on sexual assault, really, which um, yeah. doesn't go where you think it would go. I think it's it's unusual. But oh, I, I'll, I'll have, to, have to try that one. That sounds really interesting. So, Laurie, what have you been reading lately? Well, I have got two books to recommend, which I've read recently. And the first was Find Her First, Emma Christie's new one. So we had Emma on the show last. Oh, no, I haven't got that yet. Ah, oh, well, Trevor, you've got to be, got to know, got to know the right people, you see. <laughs> copy and apparently they've been delayed so um... well I got um yeah I got an ebook um version of it and it was brilliant she's um got a really amazing talent for writing and for addressing issues which aren't always addressed in um psychological suspense so it was it was a really fresh and um thrilling book I would say and then my second one which I finished just yesterday was The Sanctuary by Charlotte Duckworth who's another um guest that we've had on um which again chocker full of secrets and uh thrills and twists and I just loved it it really The Sanctuary really kept me going actually while I've been under the weather so um yeah they're my two my two books I would recommend wholeheartedly what about you Leslie well I've got um two of those on um my kindle to read the find me first Emma Christie and also the Charlotte Duckworth which I did dip into the other evening and thought oh I'm gonna love this yeah obviously this one I mean why wouldn't I be reading that that's that, that's definitely my next um to read but I'm in the middle of a book called Cruel Deeds by Catherine mm -hmm. Kerwin and um, this is really good. I'm about halfway through now, so I'd thoroughly recommend that. I think it's coming out in spring 2022. So that's an early proof. Um, and I've I've also been sent, oh, I've got Reputation by Sarah Vaughan over there. Yes. And a Harriet Tice, talking of Harriet earlier, I've got her latest, It Ends at Midnight. So I'm gonna be I've quite busy. Well. <laughs> I've got that as well, but I, I read a very late, um, version before she submitted it um oh, so right. it'd be interesting to see how much it's changed since then and also if anybody hasn't read emma christie's first book the silent daughter it's wonderful so mm, absolutely right so now it's time for our fun question trevor and as your main character jimmy mullen is a is first introduced to us as a homeless man we were wondering what's the worst night you've ever spent and why was it so bad <laughs> <laughs> it was bad like um when um, my wife and I first got married, um, the first summer we, we had a bit of a, 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 a nice break time because she's an academic, so she had a long um, summer break. And I was, I was doing my journalism training then. So I also had a long summer break. So we decided to go to India because um, I think if you're going to go there, you need a bit of time to really explore it. Um, and we had a wonderful time, um, mostly. Um, but one trip we made, we went to a, a wonderful city in the desert called Jaisalma. Uh, it's in the Rajasthan desert. So it's like a 20 hour train journey to get out there. But it's it's almost made entirely of sandstone. So as you come in on the train, there's this golden city in the middle of the desert. It's an incredibly um, striking place. Uh, but while we were there, we decided um, there was a guy who was doing trips out into the desert to to explore some of the very small villages that were out there in the temples. Uh, and also with the opportunity to spend a night in the desert, thinking, oh, this is romantic. Because it was kind of, it wasn't our honeymoon exactly, but it wasn't long after we'd been married, thinking, oh, that's that's going to be so, so lovely to just spend a night under the, under the sky in the desert. Um, so he took us on this tour and, and he, he fed us. Um, and then he drops us off in the desert and he's like, I'll be back in the morning to pick you up. And it's like, oh, fantastic. And, uh, you know, for about half an hour, it was lovely. Uh, and then the wind started up, first of all. Um, and before long, every single orifice I had was covered in sand. Um, the only way to possibly sleep was like to, to bury yourself in the sleeping bag, zip your, yourself up completely um, and keep out of the sand. Um, and as, as things couldn't get any worse, they suddenly did because I developed, let's call it Delhi Belly. Oh, no. Basically, <laughs> it, I was ill from everywhere. 
<laughs> for hours uh, and covered in sand. And it was pretty much the grimmest night ever. And we hadn't taken enough water. So there were, I, I, there's a photo of me somewhere um, early the next morning waiting for this guy to come and pick us up. I'm looking as pale as anything, but I'm sipping from a can of Carlsberg, which was the only liquid we had of course it was warm it was just um and to make matters even worse we were leaving Rajasthan the next morning so he dropped us off in Rajasthan we picked up our gear and I had to get on a rickety Indian bus and travel for 10 hours oh, gosh. whilst whilst losing liquid <coughs> and everything you can imagine um and having to leap off the bus at every single stop oh uh, find a toilet and if you've ever seen train spotting well the toilets in little Indian towns um, at that stage were probably pretty similar to the train spotting toilet mm. um, so it wasn't just an evening it carried on um, for probably the next 60 hours I think um, so yeah all pretty nasty oh dear so not really romantic at all <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the most romantic time of my life. Oh, that sounds uh, awful. We, you know, it's our 30th wedding anniversary next year. So, it, you know, we found romance elsewhere eventually. <laughs> what about you, Leslie? Um, well, I can't quite compete with that. Um, but I did have an awful night once in France. Um, we'd gone on a holiday um, with my, my, my first husband and our two kids. And... Um, my brother and his wife and their two kids. And we'd sort of booked it all. We booked a sort of jeet and everything. And we knew that we would be driving home and it would we'd need a, a, an overnight stay in France on the way home. <clears throat> and the date fell in August. And I said, we must book the hotel in advance because August is when all the French people go on holiday and all the hotels get booked up really quickly. And my brother, we'd booked up, you know, our jeet and everything. And he said, oh, no, we'll be fine. We'll just get somewhere on the way. And I said, really, I don't think, I think we should book. And he, he persuaded me that we didn't need to book and that there'd be loads of places. And I stupidly, foolishly listened to him. And of course, when we were trying to find um, somewhere to stay, we just couldn't find anywhere. Everywhere was booked up. And I, I didn't like to say, I told you so, but I kind of I hope you wanted did. to say, I told you so. <laughs> Um, and we looked at, we did find a couple of rooms, but they were really grotty and there weren't enough beds. And, you know, when you look at a bed and you think, do you know what, I'd rather mm. not. Um, so in the end, we ended up spending the night in our cars in a McDonald's um, car park, mm. you know, McDonald's takeaway. And, um, oh, God, it was awful. I mean, I hate McDonald's food at the best of times, but that's so we, we ended up eating McDonald's. And then the kids were OK because they were they were lying sort of flat out in the car but it was all right for my brother because he had a bloody great bmw we had a renault clio so it wasn't <laughs> much <laughs> oh no the kids slept fine but there was we couldn't sleep and i was still smoking then i think i got through so many fags and we had we had some perno in the boot and i thought the only way i'm going to get through this night is to drink perno so can you imagine the next morning no sleep perno fags it was like oh god <laughs> It was, yeah, it wasn't a good night. And uh, yeah, I still remind him of this, of that, you know, to this day and say, listen to me in future when we plan holidays. <laughs> listen to me. Yes. <laughs> well, at least you went on holiday with him again, though. Oh, yeah. No, we've, we're, 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 very, we're very close. We've been on holiday since. And what about you, Laurie? What's your worst night ever? Um, well, I did have a similar story to Trevor, actually, um, involving um, not a good tummy. Um, but I did it did just occur to me as you were talking about your holidays that um like I spent the first five years of my daughter's life up in the night so I'd say like, yeah she just didn't sleep for like five years so I feel like I probably ticked the box of worst night over and over and over again with that one so um yeah but it took until she went to school I think until she started sleeping so um yeah tick tick the midnight hour a few times how, there how was she now Lauren? She's now 10 and she sleeps beautifully and she's lovely. Um, but yeah, and my son, who was born first, slept like through the night from six weeks. So I thought, foolishly thought that all parents were just being a bit ridiculous about this whole sleep problem because it wasn't a problem. You know, just get me in a routine. It's all fine. And it came back to get me in spades. So yeah, five whole years. <laughs> 
Trevor, you've much. been an absolute delight to have on the show. We've really yeah, well, enjoyed you. talking to you and I'm sure our listeners will have um, been much inspired by your perseverance and, and how it's paid off in the end. It's, it, it truly is a, a, great, uh, a great story, a great road to publication. And uh, we wish you every success with uh, the paperback of uh, One Way Street and the new book, which is Dead End Street. And that's out next year, isn't it? And uh, yeah, wish you every success with that. Brilliant. Yes, we, we certainly do. Um, and now in our next episode, we'll be talking to Olivia Kiernan about oh. police procedurals. Um, and I'm a huge fan, so I'm going to have tons of questions as well for Olivia. Um, so make sure you tune in for that one too. And now, sadly, it's the end of the show. So it's goodbye from Trevor. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. It's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from them.